All right, hello, 6 p.m., Pearl Side. So good to see you all. You know, when I um, came back to this church, I was in L.A. for 10 years. I was doing ministry there, and then there was a season in my life where my wife and I started to have kids. And then when we were pregnant with our third one, we were outnumbered. We, we said, we better come back to Hawaii and get some reinforcements because my parents and my wife's parents, we all live in Pearl City. And so we, we moved back from L.A. and um, the 6 p.m., College service and young adult service, uh, 7.45, that was where I had the season of ministry. So I miss you all. It's been a while. I love this service, though, because it's a great mixture of generations. Uh, but been at downtown now for the last five years leading the Pearlside congregation there. And it's great to be back here. Um, and uh, that season, I had really young kids and I had way less white hairs. And, and now this season, it's a lot easier because the kids, they kind of know what to do on their own. I have four. The oldest is 12. The youngest is six. But the thing is, inevitably, even right now, they still forget stuff that we need. Like basic things when we're heading out, we're rushing out to church. So I came solo today. My family's not here with me. But in the mornings, right, we're rushing out to church because the pastor can't be late. That would be a really bad example. And... Um, Inevitably, we look down at people's feet in the back of the van and they're missing shoes. Like, how can you walk out of the house and not put on shoes before you get in the car? And so now it's a whole different, the season we're in now, it's a different issue. They're getting better at that. Uh, my daughter, my youngest did forget her shoes uh, a few days ago when we are heading out to Pearl Ridge. So that wasn't good. But now it's the mask, right? We're taking the kids to school and it's like, we're, we're just getting there on time. There's no time to go back home. And I hear, Daddy, I forgot my mask. It's a stressful season, right, that, that we're living in. Like, not only are we watching COVID counts go up or down, and we're worried some of us are our very livelihoods and our jobs, but even the little things like going to the store and wondering if there's going to be enough toilet paper on the shelves or if you have your mask so you can't even get in the store. And then now... You know, depending on where you're at with vaccinations, if you can even go and eat somewhere to celebrate someone's birthday if you don't have your vaccination card. And there's so many things that just stress us out. And uh, so this past week, my daughter forgot her mask. Thank God I had my mask. And mine has the adjustable ear loops where you can tighten it. But the mask itself, I have a big Chinese face. So <laughs> this is my youngest, the six-year-old. She's cute. And uh, it, it hit her whole cute face. I was like, you just got to use daddy's mask. You're going to be late for school. I tightened that ear thing as tight as possible, threw it on her face, and she just headed off to school with her BTS backpack and that huge thing covering her face. You know, and you just got to make do sometimes in the seasons that you're in. And so the, when we talk about seasons, just like having what you need, what, what do we need in the season that we're in? You know, the season of this pandemic, it's been longer than many of us thought it would go on. Um, and, of course, the whole world didn't ever see it coming. And so even as seasons are changing and definitely we as a church staff and leadership, we're sensing God is bringing a new season. And no matter what season is happening, though, how do we continue to find who God is in these seasons? And that's having a solid foundation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to start with verse 25 because... Quite frankly, Jesus is just straight up. When we have worry in no matter what season that we're in, Jesus says don't. Just don't worry. And verse 25, Jesus is speaking here. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap. Or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you, are you, are you not much more valuable than them? So let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. And as we're here, Lord God, we come to seek you, to seek your presence. And there's something about the hearing of your word that establishes a greater measure of faith inside each and every one of our hearts. And so even for the newest person that may be here today, they're not even sure they're, gonna, they're supposed to be here. God, you knew. 
You want them here, Lord God, to know more about your presence. And that's the same prayer for all of us, God, that through the hearing of your word, may you reveal a deeper revelation of who you are in our lives. And not just revelation, we also ask for transformation. So we open up our hearts to you. Have your way. Bless your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're talking about solid foundations here. And the first thing we see in this passage of Matthew chapter 6 is that foundations are connected to what is first in life. Worry is connected to what we want. And if we go back just a few verses from the verse that we opened up with in verse 19 of the same chapter, Jesus is saying this. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where, your mo for, uh, where moss and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what is going on here? When we talk about foundations are connected to what is first in life, it's talking about where is our heart. If we place our heart in the right place, then we have a firm foundation. And if we place our heart in the wrong place, then we have a rocky foundation. And when, when trials come and seasons change and we're going through seasons of difficulty, in those times when we don't have a firm foundation, that's when we get dizzy, we get confused, and we begin to be burdened down with worry. Um, as a father, we don't have, you know, there's, there hasn't been many birthday parties this past year and a half for obvious reasons. But there was a season in my life, especially when my three older kids were younger, we got invited to birthday parties like every other weekend. And usually if it's at the park, someone would rent a bounce house. And then, you know, in the bouncer, like sometimes my kids, like they're like, Daddy, come on in. And I'm like, okay, God, I'm so tired, but I'm just going to go in and play with my kids. And then, like, there's always that, like, crazy rascal kid, right, that's just, like, flying into you, bumping into you. And you're, if you've ever been in those things, right, you're trying to get your firm footing. And then other people jumping up and down make it impossible for you to have a firm footing. Why? Because that whole thing doesn't have a firm foundation. And that's what the world is like right now without the foundation of putting their heart in the right place. You know, people are jumping up and down in confusion. People are jumping up and down in fear. People are jumping up and down in anger. And it's like you're trying to keep your cool. You're trying to live that walk with God. You, should, you wake up in the morning, you're like, I'm going to have a good day in Christ today. And then just already in traffic, people are like cussing and honking their horns. And you're thinking, okay, God, I, I'm going to keep a firm foundation. And you show up at work. And then you're just trying to get your cup of coffee. And then people are, are talking about, did you hear in the news? Did you hear what Ige said? Did you see the case counts? And, and all of a sudden, you're like chill for a moment. But now, worry begins to set in. Worries can be more contagious than the Delta variant. And so what do we do? Jesus is saying here, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so... We, if we want our heart in the right place to have a firm foundation, that means we need to make sure that the things we put first, the things we value, the things we treasure in life is in the right place. And so this past year and a half, what's been happening here is that it's been checking everybody's foundation in the whole world. My foundation has been checked in my heart. There was a time where, you know, when we first shut down last year in March and April, I went through a bout of depression. I was like, man, what is happening? Why do I feel this funk? And I had such a hard time shaking it. And God was saying, you've depended on so many other things than me, than the things of heaven. Your heart wasn't in the right place. And so in those moments, as I began to steer it back to the things of heaven, God then began to give me peace and the worry began to subside. In fact, when we look Back at our main text of Matthew 6, verse 25, he says, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and body more than clothes? So yes, I am Chinese, if you're wondering. And um, this is like a, a good verse for Chinese people. See, you don't need to go eat the expensive dinners and buy the nice clothes. You know, just wear like, let, let it just get all puka and raggedy. <laughs> That's what the scripture is saying. 
right? Like we, can, we can misconstrue this idea of, of not having nice clothes or eating like at fancier restaurants. That's not what Jesus is trying to teach us here. What he's saying is sometimes we get caught up in these other things. When we don't even realize the most essential thing is life itself. And so we get caught up in the auxiliary things of life like food and fashion. But we get mixed up in realizing that we lose track of our faith. And so he's telling us that this is more important, life. And, you know, growing up, speaking of food, I remember, you know, at school, there would be like the rich kids or the kids that were spoiled that would come to school with like chicken katsu plate lunches. And I'm like drooling, this Chinese boy just staring at them with my mouth open, like longing for chicken katsu with the katsu sauce and the white rice, you know. And I had like school lunch and then field trips were the worst. Because like all these kids would have like zip packs with the like the Hawaiian sun frozen in the paper towel. <laughs> I wouldn't have any of that. I just have like this old crusted sandwich like from ham that I don't know sure where, how old it is. And there's like nothing in there. It's just, just dry sandwich. I'm eating my dry sandwich like, man, I hate my life. And the funny thing is, like, I didn't realize, though, you know, my parents, they worked so hard as I was growing up. And I lost track of what was important. I mean, I was a kid, okay. But I didn't realize at that time as I reflect back now and I have the opportunity to see, wow, my parents worked really hard. And there was never a day that I went hungry. There was never a time that I questioned, would I have money for school lunch or did my mom pack me something for field trips? I always had a meal, no matter what. And so here, I was feeling disgruntled. I was feeling worried about not having the best type of food when the essential parts of life my parents were providing for me. And I think some of us here, you know, I, I know I made light of like school lunches and things like that. But sometimes we get caught up in these things that we get so used to in life. And as seasons change and we lose some of these things and it gets stripped away from us. And we forget that, man, we're sitting here right now. And the fact that we're not dead, but we still have breath in our lungs, that God is not done with us, that he's still working out a great plan and a great destiny in our lives. But sometimes worry will say, no, this is a dead end. When God is saying, no, this is just the beginning. I have something else for you. And so what do we do with that in those moments when worry tries to set in? Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. See, earlier, Jesus was saying that don't store up your treasures in the wrong place where thieves break in and steal. And now, in Proverbs, what we see is this idea of guarding our heart. See, worry doesn't just happen to us. It's we allow it to happen because we're not guarding our hearts. And so Jesus, in our main text, he's saying our worry is connected to what we watch. So the things that we look at and fixate on and focus are the things that we allow to, into our hearts. As we continue verse 26, Jesus again is saying, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And your, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life and why do you worry about clothes see how the flowers of the field grow they do not labor or spin and so here is this idea right where Jesus you know this is like misinterpreting Jesus again right we had Chinese Jesus a moment ago oh never mind eating you know all you can eat that's expensive $28.99 like even though you try to fill up and get super full just, just eat modestly and dress modestly. That's not what Jesus was saying then. And this is not what Jesus is saying here where we think of either like reggae Jesus or hippie Jesus. You know, Jesus with the long hair and the Birkenstock. He's not saying, <laughs> he's not walking around eating granola bars saying, you know, like coming up with a reggae beat. He's like, oh, look at the birds of the air and the flowers in the field. <laughs> Don't worry. You know, he's like, <laughs> he's not, he's like, what, you sure that's lilies or are you smelling something else, Jesus? Like, that's not what's happening, okay? Because <laughs> if, if that's all we're reading this passage and we're like, that's it, we're, we're missing out on what Jesus is trying to say. And so what he's trying to tell us here 
is that when we look at the birds of the air, right, and we're looking up, sometimes we get so caught up at looking at what we don't have, but let's look at what the birds do have, right? They're, they're taken care of, and they're birds. And in the same thing, the flowers continue to, to grow, and they're flowers. And Jesus is saying, your heavenly father, in the same passage, he's saying, your heavenly father knows you need these things, you know, clothes and food. And so we forget who our heavenly father is. And what's amazing about this passage is he's comp contrasting. Okay, we in here, we're all his children. We are the pinnacle of creation. There's not one of us that's created here by chance or by accident. He knows every single one of us as his son, as his daughter. Every one of us. We're important to him. And so if birds are taken care of, birds are not his kids, okay. He's not, a, he's not one of those people with like the cat people with like 20 cats in his house. Okay, so bir cats, dogs, birds, lilies, like he created those things, yes. But when he created us, he created us with a greater purpose because we are created in his image. And so when he created us, he calls us his children and we are to refer to him as father. And so this idea here, when we look at the birds and we remember, man, God is taking care of them. And that's just God, but he's our father. So how much more will he not take care of me? And so no matter what we're going through, we need to remember who God is and not forget and just fixate on the things, on what we don't have or what we're losing. When we submit to his authority, that's how we allow him to be our father. And I, I know in this uh, day and age, this word authority can be like a cuss word. You know, it's not very popular authority. Everyone wants to buck authority. But if God is truly to be our father and we are truly to trust him as our father, then we need to submit to his authority. But here's the good news. See, we all are committed or um, created to submit to something. And if we, if we don't submit to God as our authority, we end up submitting to anxiety. So it's a choice that we get to make every single day of our lives that, you know, I'm going to choose today to worship God as my father and submit to his authority. If not, I end up submitting to anxiety. Something else ends up ruling my heart. Matthew 6, 33, 34, Jesus is saying this, seek first his kingdom. Kingdom speaks of authority, his rulership. And his righteousness and all these things. See, God does know about the things that in our lives that we care about. The things that we need. So all these things will be given to you as well. Verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So as the downtown Pearlside pastor, um, you know, I have the opportunity of meeting people uh, throughout the last few year and a half of, of going through this pandemic. And there's a longtime member when we first started uh, out in downtown. We we're at the Ala Moana Hotel. Some of you came out with us when we first planted in downtown. And um, it, it's this couple that, you know, they're, they're, they've grown in leadership. And uh, he asked me, hey, can I meet with you this past week? And so I made time for him. We sat down. And I was wondering what's going on in his life. And he's just telling me, you know, just what he sees in the kingdom and how we can help others grow in faith, especially in this vital time that we're in, in a pandemic. And so I'm hearing him out. And so I'm like, man, he's talking a lot about the kingdom of God, which is good because the scripture says seek first the kingdom. But I realized I didn't ask him how he's doing and how his wife is doing. And so I said, how's everything at home? And he told me, you know, my wife is doing well, but she's right now just filled with worry. I was like, why? Because she hasn't worked for a few months, and she's having a really hard time finding work. I was like, wow, I'm going to make sure I pray for you. How are you doing with all that? And then he goes on. He's like, well, I'm doing okay, but right now at my job, they're um, going to be making everyone get vaccinated at work, or you are in jeopardy of losing your job. And... Not, I'm not trying to open up this issue in this message, but we've talked about it at length in prior messages. But here at Pearlside Church, we believe that you are to trust God in your faith and in whatever information that you receive through the filter and the lens of Scripture and the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And there's people in our church that worship God. We can come together 
whether you are really strong on vaccinations and why that is a good thing or why you are really against vaccinations and why that is a good thing for you. And so for this gentleman, he believes that he should not get vaccinated. And it's not because he's afraid of the vaccination. It's because he's afraid of God. Fear of God meaning is of his authority. He surrendered to God and like, God, I'm trusting you. And this is something that for his faith, he le- believes God is telling him not to get vaccinated. And so already he's already down on income in his household. And he's in jeopardy of losing his personal income. And so they both won't have anything. And I said, how are you dealing with that? And he said, you know, I, I told my wife we're going to be okay. Because there was about six, seven years ago, we went through a time where neither of us worked. And yet God provided. There was things that God was doing for us in the two months without income. He was providing for us. Things that we didn't even expect. And she forgot about that. So I had to remind her, he told, her, he told me. I had to remind her that God came through for us before he's going to come through for us again. And I love that because... This whole time, when we got together, he wasn't even concerned about his own life. And this is like, you know, not just like buying a new car or eating out at a nice restaurant. This is like just even being able to put food on the table of his household, paying his rent or mortgage. So this is a big deal, but yet he knows God is in control. He has a firm foundation in who God is in his life. And this is how it applies to all of us. Maybe some of us were like, well, that's good for him because he's seen God move in the past. What about me? Well, regardless of what we may recognize or not recognize and what God has done for us before, what he has done for each and every single one of us is he gave his most precious gift 2,000 years ago. And his name is Jesus. And God allowed his son to die on the cross for our sins. And that is the most precious thing God could have ever done for us. And he's already done it. And because we have a risen and resurrected Savior, no matter what we go through, no matter what seasons rock our life, we can have peace. We don't have to allow worry to enter. Because we trust in him. And what God has already done, how much more so, if he provided 2,000 years ago on the cross, will he not provide today, tomorrow, and the days after to come? So Galatians 1 says this, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So here's the idea, right, of allowing ourselves to be yielded to God's authority so we don't yield ourselves to anxiety. So much of anxiety today comes besides the pandemic through us trying to think like, what does this guy think? What does my boss think? Right, what does my friend think of this? And there's just so much like news and then news that um, say, are then said it's like fake news and fact checked. That fact check sometimes is not even fact. And it's so confusing, all this contrasting reports and news and we get confused like who do I listen to when we need to just listen to God and trust him first and foremost. And, but this is the kicker. In Philippians 4, so what do we do when worry does come? Philippians 4 says, the Lord is near. And I just want to camp here for a quick second. Because some of us, we feel like in this season that you're in right now, you feel like God is super far. But God is not a liar and his word never fails and his word never changes. So when this was written hundreds of years ago saying the Lord is near, God is still saying that to us today and saying that to you your heart, that the Lord is near. And as we receive that, verse 6 then says, do not be anxious about anything. But in, et, et, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. See, there's a battle for our hearts and our battle for our minds every day. Where worry tries to break in like a thief. But here, God is giving us the alarm system to trigger a defense 
against worry from entering into our hearts, from being able to control our thoughts or consume us. And, um, you know, when I was growing up, like I said, my parents, they worked really hard, right. They're working like late hours to provide because they're first generation, moved from Hong Kong. Um, I was born here, so I'm an ABC, American born Chinese. And, uh, but I, so I had to take care of myself a lot at home. And I remember one day I was at home by myself and um, all of a sudden I hear some noise downstairs. I'm like, what's going on? And I, I go peek, I go, I see I speak in Chinese. I, I go peek, I go and peek and I see someone breaking into my house. I'm like, what's happening? So I, I quickly run into a room, lock myself in the room, and I call 911. And then the cops quickly come. And when the cops arrive, the thief that entered into my house was still in the house taking stuff. And so they chased him through the house. And it's crazy because he ended up jumping through the mesh screen of a window. So you can actually see, I remember later on after the cops left, I went downstairs to examine what happened. You could see the outline of the dude look like Looney Tunes when he jumped in the screen because you can see the cutout. <laughs> you know, they, they fly out. And he got away. He got away. It's crazy. And so my parents, like, to, to make sure that I was safe and our whole household was safe, they um, hired an alarm company to come, and they installed an alarm. And so now, whether we're away from the home, we set the alarm, or even when we're at home, there's that stay feature where the motion sensors are deactivated, but the, all the windows and the doors are, are armed. And so I remember a nut, there was a, 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 just shortly after, into the, after that moment, and the alarm was installed, the alarm went off. And this time, someone tried to break into my dad's um, garage room where he has all his, like, tools and it's expensive stuff. But nothing was stolen. Why? Because the alarm went off. The siren is super loud. And the thief just quickly bolted without being able to take anything. And that's what prayer does in our life. And that's why God is telling us to be alert in our prayer. Because when we pray... It's an automatic alarm system that's activated that I'm not going to let worry. I'm not going to let anxiety. I'm not going to let fear come and rob my joy, rob my peace, rob my destiny. Because that's what worry does. Worry is like a rocking chair. You ever been in a rocking chair? I know we don't have a lot of those here in Hawaii. But it's like a rocking chair. You know, you see the old people just sitting on it in their porch. You're doing something, but you're going nowhere. And that's what worry does. It just keeps you in motion and you don't have rest. You don't have peace. When God's saying, I am navigating you out of this season into a new season. But we're stuck in the current season because of being consumed and locked in by worry. But what prayer does is it, it activates faith in our life. And it reminds us that God is our father in these moments. And the reason why God hears every single one of our prayers is because of already how God provided in the past. Because of the blood of Christ, we have direct access and the relationship with our Heavenly Father. Well, you're in for a treat because today, it's like a, you know when you go to the movies and then, I don't know, back, I don't know if we still have these, but it's like two movies. You get to like stay, extended feature. I forgot to tell you in the beginning, I meant to say it, it's a tag team preach today with our very own campus minister, Lexen Lomibao. We're, I'm going to have him come up because it's a new season. He's serving with me at the downtown congregation. He just started doing that. Just got engaged too, to his beautiful fiance, Jess. And, um, but even the, the whole story of how God brought him from L.A. to here. We got that L.A. connection, man. Um, it's, it's such a great testimony of, of God building faith in Lexan's life and dealing with worry. And so we're going to be blessed by this. Please open up your hearts and receive from Lexan. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Pastor Nomi talks about movies. Uh, Pastor Norman actually called us Hobbs and Shaw this morning. And I don't know who's Hobbs. I don't know who's Shaw. I think he's the Hobbs. But if you don't know me, I'm just a random Filipino from Panorama City, California. That was saved not in a church, not in a small group, but actually at a club in San Diego. Long story short, the person who saved me was actually an Uber driver who picked me up from the club, started speaking the word of God to me, and then he committed to discipling me for about two years where I was, he was just really building that foundation of faith. And then after those two years, that was one season. That season led to another season where it shifted, where 
I was actually working a job, and I was actually working this very well-paid job. But when I was driving home on this Thursday to get ready to go to this retreat on this Friday, I'm driving down the freeway, and then I look to my left, and then I see a palm tree. And then I heard God say so explicitly and clearly, you're going to move to Hawaii. And I was like, what? Am I just thinking that because Hawaii is a beautiful place? I feel like I'm going to meet a beautiful wahine on the beach and I'm going to get married. And honestly, I found a beautiful wahine, but she wasn't on the beach. She was in church. But I'll go ahead and pray. I'll go ahead and preach on that another time. But when God told me that, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to keep this word Hawaii and I'm going to keep it in my pocket. And I'm going to go to this retreat and see what he says. And then I go to this retreat in Denver, Colorado. And then throughout that time, there's confirmation after confirmation after confirmation from one person that knows another person that knows a pastor, that knows Pastor Billy Lyle, that was actually in charge of the internship here in Hawaii. And while I'm there, this guy says, hey, you, you really feel like God is telling you about Hawaii? I think you should really pray about it because this internship has a young, most of them are Filipino, and young, and they're fired up for God. They love Jesus, and they want to make a change in the world, and I think you'll be perfect for it. But not going to lie, when I heard about that, my first instinct and my first response was, man, I think I might need to sell my brand new 2014 Scion FRS that I just bought. But right at that moment, when my buddy was telling me about the internship, I said, man, I think I might have to sell that car. And he looked at me dead in the eyes and he said, yes, you might have to sell that car. And I'm like, dang it, because I was brought to this part in the Bible, in the book of Matthew, where he talks about the rich young ruler. Who is the rich young ruler? The rich young ruler is a man who ran up to Jesus when he asked him, he said, Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And then Jesus said, he said, you already know, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't kill. But then he said, but I'm going to challenge you and I'm going to push you further in your faith. And I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you, how about you sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. But then what did the rich young ruler do? He left away what? Sad. And I was going to, because he couldn't do it, because Jesus wasn't after his belongings, about, about his work, but he was after his heart. Because like Pastor Tim said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And I was convicted because I'm like, man, is my heart with my car or is my heart in God? And then at that moment, I kept on still praying throughout the entire weekend. And then that, the last morning, I wake up at 5 in the morning and I end up going on this hike. I go up this big, huge mountain about 10,000 feet above sea level, and I'm hiking up this mountain, and I meet two different guys. We're talking story, getting to know one another, and then we get to the top, and I'm saying, man, God is saying something about Hawaii, but I think I still need to pray about it because it just sounds so crazy. And the guy said, why don't we just pray about it right now on this mountain? And I was like, ooh, he's like, maybe we'll get an answer. And I was like, I don't know if I want the answer, but... <laughs> He puts his hand on my shoulder, and then he starts praying. He says, God, I pray that if it is your will for Lexington to move to Hawaii, I pray that you give him a vision. And now I want to ask you this. How many of you guys have seen the movie 50 First Dates with Adam Sandler? Yeah, everybody here, right? So I'm not preaching over your head. So the vision that I saw was of his one-eyed homie and his friend with a coconut bra, and he was shooting the video, and he'd say, oh, man, I'm super. I'm not going to say because we're in church. Come on, people. But... That was the vision that I saw. And before I even told him about the vision, the guy started laughing. And he said, God, I thank you for giving him that vision and the confirmation for him to move to Hawaii. You know that guy got a sense of humor. But I come down this mountain kind of feeling like Moses with the Ten Commandments and I'm just so on fire. I tell the group that I was with, I say, hey, everyone, I'm going to move to Hawaii. And they're all super, they're all like, yeah, let's go. I had no idea what my next step was. I just knew that God gave me a word, so I'm going to follow it. So I end up going back to San Diego, and then the next thing I do is I, I apply for the internship, and then I get on a phone call with Pastor Sean Withy Allen. If you don't know who he is, he's the lead pastor of Manor Church Hawaii. He was also personally discipled by Pastor Norman Nakanishi, and he actually, actually got discipled in this church, and then he got transitioned over to Manor Church Hawaii. And he was also one of the directors for the internship. But we do the interview. I get in, I get accepted, and then the next step God says, he says, now create a GoFundMe account, and then just post, get your phone, and then shoot a little video of yourself, of your testimony, of your story, and then post it online. And I post it online, and then God provided about $3,500 just to get me out to Hawaii. And then God said, now put in your two weeks at your job that you're actually making pretty good money at, and then go ship your car, because see, I got grace, I'm not going to make you sell your car. And then buy a plane ticket. 
and then I ended up buying the plane ticket. And I'm not going to lie, like how we talked about here in the verse where it said, am I living for the approval of man or am I living for the approval of God? Because obviously, as you can see, I am full Filipino. So if I'm not a doctor, lawyer, nurse, or engineer, then obviously I'm like a disgrace to the family. So my mom was like, Lexan, what's wrong with you? You're so crazy. And I was like, man, but I'm crazy for Jesus, mom. But she didn't understand at that point. But this anxiety that I was feeling, it was automatically lifted when I got onto the plane. And the peace of Christ that transcends all understanding was what was overwhelming me when I took that faith step of obedience. And then after that, long story short from there, I do the internship. God really shows up. He reveals his calling to church planting. And throughout the entire year of the internship, I got offered two different opportunities to work for two different churches. One of them was for Manor Church Hawaii with Sean Woody Allen. Pastor Sean Woody Allen, and then the other one was here with us at Grace Bible Church Pearlside. Now, no offense, but the offer for Manor Church Hawaii was actually a lot more, I would say, tempting because it was a guaranteed paid salary, 401k benefits, and I was like, man, if you do this for four years and then you just serve faithfully, we will send you out after these four years and you can plant your own church and we'll give you half of whatever you need for this church plant. And then right at that moment, I said, yes, hallelujah, God, that is you. Praise him, hallelujah. But then I went to this ENC conference. Long story short, I ended up seeing all these young people just experience the power and the presence of God. And God said, when you got saved at the age of 21 years old, I want you to do the same thing that I did for you. And I want you to do it for the next generation. And, but at that moment, God said, it's not going to be safe. It's not going to be polished. It's not going to be even clear. But what you have right now is the word and the promise that I've given you that I'm going to use you in ways you never thought, but you just need to trust me. And he said, because the winds are shifting and the seasons are changing. My season was changing. And I just feel led that everybody sitting here, we know that there are seasons that are changing in our lives that God is saying, it's time to pivot. It's time to shift. It's time to change. But at that moment, I said, okay, I'm going to go on this thing. I ended up serving the church, and it was great. Last thing that happened was my mom got COVID-19. I know a lot of you are very aware. But when my mom got COVID-19, my sure foundation was shaken up to the core. Because I was at a point where I said, God, I'm doing everything you want me to do, but why is my mom about to die from COVID-19? And then what God told me at that moment, because he said, I want you to go back home. I want you to go back to Los Angeles. I want you to go back to your family members. But I was worrying. I was anxious. What was I anxious about? First off, I was scared that I was going to get sick. Second thing is, was that I'm working for the ministry. So at this point, or at that point, I was like, I don't got money to buy a plane ticket and to stay in a hotel. But then what did God say? God said, I will provide for you. I will make a way. And when I, when I take that leap of faith, I went. God ended up really showing up because at that point, my mom got miraculously healed. She pulled off the face mask off of her face of the ventilator twice in one night. And then she was able to be pushed out because she was healed completely physically. And she was able to go back home. But at that moment, too, I didn't know what God was doing because God said, I'm going. You're not going just for your mom, but you're going for your dad. Because at that point, my dad was at the end of his rope about to lose the love of his life where his heart was finally open to the gospel. And then God said, now I'm going to send his youngest son, to preach the gospel and disciple him. And then I'm going to use you to actually baptize both of your parents before you go back to Hawaii. Can we give God some praise for that? So as I'm sharing this story, this story was just, and this testimony was just shared to show that even when things may seem faithless and even when we are faithless, God will always prove himself what? faithful because he knows that we are called and we are heading into a season of victory but we need to be willing to step into it submit to his authority and not submit to anxiety or fear or worry because God says you are more valuable than the lilies and the sparrows and I feed them so if you're more valuable how am I not going to feed you and I'm not just going to feed you chicken nuggets or even some zip packs I'm going to I'm going to feed you a prime rib from Roy's or something like <laughs> But see, that's what I feel led to encourage all of us as we head into a time of worship. Is that all of us, first off, can we all just stand up, please? And as we get into this time of worship and as we get into God's presence, if you feel comfortable, I would love for you to put your hands up. And it's just a physical expression saying that you believe that God is going to take care of you. Where you believe that God is going to make a way in your relationships. 
in your finance, your financial situation, in your job situation, even, even, even with your un, uncertain future that you might see right ahead of you. So as we go into worship, please go ahead and put your hands as a sign of surrender as we, as we bask in God's presence together.